Welcome to Hope Church. If you're joining us online, welcome. We are glad that you are here. As we are want to say here at Hope Church, welcome home. If it's your first time or maybe first time in a long time, whether that's being here at Hope Church or being in a church period, we want you to know that you are most welcome in this place and in this space, and we hope that you experience the goodness of God's love and mercy and grace today. So welcome. We are glad that you're here. Today, we are beginning a new message series entitled Uncomfortable. This will take us through the rest of August, and so I'm really glad that you're here this morning as we're kicking it off and getting it started, because I've got to just start with the first question. I mean, it really begs the obvious, right? How many of you are comfortable right now? Really? Okay. Hopefully, the air conditioning's nice, the chairs aren't too bad, you know, the lighting is a little bright, but hey, it's good, right? You can see me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> but beyond the obvious, right, we're comfortable here in this moment. How many of us are comfortable existentially? Like, how many of us are comfortable in life right now with the way things are going in our lives, in our community, in our world? How many of us feel comfortable right now? Not many, do we? Not many of us feel comfortable right now. In fact, uh, this is a really, really unusual time to be doing life. We have a global pandemic going around, and with all of its ups and downs, its peaks and valleys, and its rolling average. I thought about rolling down the stage in a somersault or something, but I thought that would be a very, very bad visual. <laughs> I thought it would be a very, very bad visual. Yeah, we have all these things that are, that are causing us unrest, that are calling, causing angst, that are causing us to feel uncomfortable. We also have all this social unrest. We're in the middle of an election year. Did you, did you know that? Did you know we're in the middle of an election year? And unless you, um, unless you aren't really paying very close attention, it's almost like the world gets more chaotic during an election year. Can you believe it? Why do you think that may be? It's, I think, in many ways to make people uncomfortable, to try to press agendas and to press buttons of power and levers and things like that. There are all kinds of things going on in the world right now to cause us to feel uncomfortable. And this is contrary to the way that our minds, our bodies, and our souls want to live. I remember being in high school biology, and I remember learning about the theory of homeostasis. Does anyone remember what homeostasis means? It's the fact that we all have this need and this, and this desire, but it's really more than just in our head. It's also in our body for things to be in balance and at peace and at rest. We yearn for homeostasis when we do not experience it. We yearn for things to feel balanced and at peace and at rest when everything seems to be so contradictory to that. We yearn for that. And yet we look around... We look at the television, we look at our social media feeds, look at our screens, regardless of they're this big, this big, or this big, and we see so much that causes us to feel uncomfortable. We see so much that causes us to feel uncomfortable. And some of it, dare I say, I think is deliberate. So that we can begin to ask some of the questions that maybe people are trying to prod us to ask and go in certain directions that certain powers want to prod us in which to go. And how many of these proddings and urgings have us actually going to the cross or the church? I'm going to ask that again because I'm not sure that you heard me. <laughs> how many of these nudgings and these proddings have us go to the cross or even to the church? None. None. Or well, very few. And so that's what we hope to challenge throughout this series this month is the places and the spaces that the powers that be are urging you to turn and to go that don't have anything to do with the cross or the church that you just turn the other way, the other direction and you just keep on easing on down the road, Right? You keep on easing on down the road. I actually played, uh, I was in the Wiz in high school. Um, I was not Dorothy for any of you who were asking. Uh, <laughs> more on that in a moment. I'm kidding. Uh, I'm teasing, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. But we need to turn our face. And this reminds me of a verse that uh, is really powerful and potent right now. 
2 Corinthians 7.14. I want to get it right. It says, this is where God's talking to Solomon as Solomon dedicates the temple. He says, if my people seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Okay, so Solomon is consecrating the temple and God is offering all these promises. Everything seems to be going well. It seems to be going happy-go-lucky. Everything seems to be just as it should. And all of a sudden, God drops this truth bomb on them and says there are going to be times when you are going to feel uncomfortable. There are going to be times when you are going to experience famine and struggle and trouble. And what do you do when those times come? God himself said this to Solomon. If my people seek my face and turn from, my, turn from their wicked ways, God's not wicked, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. It may seem contradictory in ways for us to not turn the directions that the powers that be in the world and culture and community are telling us to turn, but to turn to the cross to turn to the church and say, dear Lord, as you con consecrate your temple, as you put your presence in our midst, that's where I want to turn my face. Not to social media, not to the television, not to the newspapers, if you've heard of those things. I want you to turn, that was a joke. I want you to turn your face. This is God saying it to me. So oftentimes we read verses like this and we run across something known as the if-then principle. God says it. If you look for my face and you turn from your wicked ways, I will forgive your sin and heal your land. So basically, there's this if-then principle in play. If you seek my face and turn from your wicked ways, I will forgive your sin and heal your land. And we take that principle and then we apply it to other things that we think should or could make a difference in our sense of discomfort. Well, if I get this new raise, then I can get a new house or a new job or a new car or a new uh, mobile phone or a new guitar or a new computer or a new sewing machine or whatever new, right? If I get this, then this. And so we, apply, we start applying these if-then principles into other aspects and other arenas of our lives. If I get married, then I'll do all this other stuff. And if I get that new job, then I'll start tithing to the church or whatever. We start applying these if-then principles. But God wants to set the original if-then principle for you and for me and for the church and for all the world that if you seek my face and turn from your old worn out ways of living, then I'm going to forgive your sin and heal your land. We apply these if-then principles to other things, almost as though we can bargain or barter with God. If you do this for me, Lord then I'll do that for you. We need to hear that call and response in the way that God always intended it to be. If you seek my face and turn from your old, worn out, burned out way of living, then I'm gonna forgive your sin and I'm gonna heal your land. We've got to get the cart and the horse in their proper placement, don't we? We've gotta get our cart and our horse in their proper placement. And so, dear Lord, help us with that. But the reality is that when we do that, or if we do that, then we're going to discover something else that is a little bit uncomfortable, and that is doing life in a countercultural order or manner. Are you with me? If we start doing things against the way that the world or culture or society tells us to do it, then we are going to experience more discomfort. And there's going to be this cognitive and maybe even in some way, shape, or form, a spiritual dissonance, if you will. This is, uh, now, if I just go the way of the world, then I'm going to feel better. But that's not the way it works. God says, if you turn, my, turn to my face and away from your old, worn out, burned out way of living, then you will experience the hope and the peace that you're seeking. I referenced this last week as we closed that out, uh, as we had our first uh, service. I don't remember what last week was. <laughs> anyway, it was August 2nd, right? Anyway, talked about me as the place. We overcome with Christ the world that causes us trouble but we have to be with Christ. And so that's where we are starting with our uncomfortable series this week, is we're going to start by looking at the way that we come and experience Christ. And one of the most powerful and profound things to do is to come to the church. Because the church, we strive, sometimes we get it 
better than others and sometimes we just flat out miss the mark, but we strive to follow the cross, to lead to the cross, to help people know that God is real and he loves us and has a plan and a purpose for our lives. Have you heard that before? Please say yes. Yes, okay, great, great, great. Yeah, God, lo- God is real, God loves us and has a plan and a purpose for our lives. So we turn to the church. It's a way to help steward us and direct us in this new way of living and experiencing the world. But the reality is, is that so often we are looking for the perfect church. Have you found it? I mean, we've come pretty close. But have we found the perfect church? I'm just using a for instance. If this was the perfect church, then it became imperfect the moment I walked through the doors, right? And that applies to all of us. That applies to all of us. I'm only partially joking, but I'm trying to use humor to pull out a point. There's no such thing as the perfect church. Church is not about your preferences. It's about knowing God. Now, the church is known as the body of Christ at work in the world. That's what the church is known as, as the body of Christ. And who is the head of the church? Don't say Mark, say Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church. I remember one time I was in a conflict with somebody, and this person came to me, was really, really angry, and said, who's in charge here? And I said, I hope Jesus. But we're an imperfect group of people trying to do perfect work. And that's the reality. Church is not just about our preferences. It's about knowing God. And one of the things that God, I think, deliberately allows, just like famines and hunger and, disapp- and disappointments and problems that he was telling Solomon when the temple was consecrated, is that sometimes the way that God works, even through our times we feel uncomfortable, we feel discomfort, is that God works to show us the power of grace and mercy. Think about that for a moment. We always want things to be in balance, but sometimes God allows imbalance so that we can experience the true power of grace and mercy and that at times gets lived out in our lives with other people. First Peter chapter two, verses four through five, and then verse nine reads, as you come to him, the living stone, this is talking about Jesus, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also like living stones are built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. If you seek my face and you turn from your wicked ways, I will forgive your sin and heal your land. What was it that Jesus came specifically to do? It was to die to pay the penalty of our sin, to pay our sin debt, our payment. And through that payment, make us one with God. Did Jesus wait until we were perfect? No. He did it even in the midst of our very own and sometimes major imperfections. But he did it out of love. And he's asking and he's calling and he's charging and challenging every single one of us to go into the world through the church, this vehicle that is the hands and the feet and the body of Christ to be at work and active in this world to help people know that God is real, God loves us and has a plan and a purpose for our lives. And so we have to fight the temptation to look for the perfect church, to think that the perfect church is here or right around the corner or whatever and say, Lord, even in the midst of my own imperfections, even in the times and the places and the spaces where I get it wrong, help me and help this organization that we know as the church, your body, to turn and seek your face and seek the forgiveness of sins. The next point is the Christian life is supposed to be uncomfortable. So embrace it. Truth bomb. I mean, I'd do a mic drop, but I'd hit my head. Right? Anyway, it really wasn't nearly as funny as I imagined it would be. But still, the Christian life is supposed to be uncomfortable. So embrace it. Why is it supposed to be uncomfortable? It's because it runs countercultural. The Christian life is supposed to be uncomfortable, so embrace it. So what does it mean to embrace an uncomfortable way of living? 
Well, I kind of alluded to it in the beginning. It's to turn away from all of the people and the forces and the power at work in our world that try to say, if you just turn to this place, if you turn to this channel, if you turn to this website, or if you turn to this substance, if you turn to this, if you turn to anything other than God, then you will find the help that you need. But it doesn't come in anything other than the power and the person of Jesus Christ. And so we are called to live even in an uncomfortable world because we live in a world that is trying to tell us that anything other than God can meet our needs and soothe our troubled spirits. But this isn't the way of Christ. What was it that Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 25? Jesus said, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Boy, that sounds uncomfortable, doesn't it? How many of you hate your lives? Don't answer that, right? At least, yeah. How many of you, how many of you hate the way that certain things are going? And you hate the struggle, you hate the tension. But what is it that Jesus is telling us to do? It's to embrace the discomfort and to turn away from the things and the people and the places and the substances and the items and all of the tomfoolery and malarkey that in the world is going to tell you that if you just abide by this, follow this plan, then you will find the hope and the help that you need. Jesus is like, you're only going to find it if you surrender your life. Be willing to lose it for my sake. Have you ever experienced anything like this? Let me put it in a way that perhaps you've experienced or you can experience. When you serve in a mission project, or even serve on a Sunday morning at the church. The world might be inclined to say, why don't you take that hour to get an earlier tea time or an earlier restaurant reservation? Or why don't you you take that time and maybe the money and, and go do something for yourself? Have a little me time. But there's something incredible that happens when we say, no, I'm, I'm gonna go to church I'm going to serve on the host team or the tech team or in the student or kids ministries team. I'm going to give money away or maybe it's a mission trip. You're actually taking your vacation time to go serve in a foreign land, even if that foreign land's, you know, 25 miles away, right? But to take your time and your energy, your money, your precious resources and to apply it to something that doesn't bring you any immediate return on that investment. But what happens when you do? What happens when you take vacation time to go on a mission trip or maybe to serve during vacation Bible school? Or what happens when you come on a Sunday morning when you could have been at brunch or a golf tea time or something like that? What happens when you give of yourself? What do you find? That you get far more in return than you ever could have put into it. Have you ever experienced something like that? If you haven't, I want to encourage you to pay attention to these Sign Up Sundays. Because there is something powerful and awesome that happens when we surrender some of our wants and our needs and our desires and we give to God, we give to God's church and we see God do miracles through those. I can remember being a youth director and going on a mission trip and just being, I mean, as a youth director, right? Being absolutely amazed at people who took vacation time and paid money out of their own pockets to chaperone a youth camp or mission trip or something like that. But I would always hear invariably at the end of it that they got so much more out of it than they ever put in. You see, this is the way that Christian service works. And God wants us to bring it to the church as he consecrates all of us for his work and his ministry in the world. To turn away from all those things that the world's going to tell you. It's going to make you happy. It's going to fill those needs and fulfill those desires and put it forth in the work and the service for others through Christ Jesus. Which brings us to our third point. Jesus gives us our ultimate example. Jesus gives us our ultimate example. Now here's every part God who was involved in the creations of the heavens and the earth. If you go back and look in Genesis 1, God says things like, let us make humanity in our own image. He's referring to a Trinitarian nature there. Jesus was present at creation, right? He has 
the earth as his footstool, so to speak, and yet he comes to earth to show us the way. Let's look at our Bible verse for this, for Jesus as our ultimate example from Philippians chapter two, verses five through eight. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Oh my goodness, I could almost speak a whole speech, listen to me, I could almost speak a whole sermon on that, right? He did not use his... his uh, Equality with God is something to use to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus is our ultimate example of what it means to be willing to surrender our lives for the sake of God and for others. Jesus is the ultimate perfect example of what happens when we say, God, following your face, seeking your will, turning from the things that I think are gonna bring me happiness and contentment and pleasure and even hope in a worldly sense, turning away from that and turning toward you. That's how I want to live my life and I want to see the miracles that you want to accomplish and achieve when I'm willing to lay down my own heart, or my own desires, my own soul, my own everything in order to see you glorified and lived out around us. So it comes down to things that we've looked at already in my short tenure here at Hope Church. The Great Commission and the Great Commandment. It's to go into all the world to make disciples, to make new and better followers of Jesus Christ. It's following the Great Commission because of the Great Commandment. To love God with all that we have and all that we are and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Is that easy? No. Is it comfortable? Mm, hardly. But what it is, is it worth it? Absolutely. We've got to break this if-then cycle of thinking that if I do this, then this is going to happen. If I buy this, then I'm going to feel worthy or valuable or important. If I spend my time anywhere other than seeking the cross, the church, then I'm going to feel the contentment and the desire and the, the hope that I need and get back to the original if-then statement. Remember, when God told Solomon those words, if my people seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will forgive their sin and heal their land. When God said that, it was a time of great rejoicing and celebration. He was telling and prescribing the method and the means to deal with the discomfort in the world that was inevitably going to come by saying when those times get tough, the tough are going to think they got to get going to a certain place to buy a certain thing. What I'm telling you is if you turn to me, then you're going to find the contentment. You're going to find the hope you're going to find the peace and the love. You're going to find comfort in a very uncomfortable world. And so now that we are in the midst of some great discomfort in our community and creation, I think it does us a lot of good to seek the face of God, not just the blessings that we oftentimes tend to chase after, and to seek God's forgiveness, to do an honest assessment, to find out the places where we've strayed, we've done things against God's will and God's way and God's word, and to say, dear Lord God, I want to follow your ways. I want to lead to the cross or be led to the cross. And through your church, I want to help the world know that you still are real, that you still love us, and you still have a plan and a purpose for our lives. So who this morning, whether you're here or if you're joining us online, who this morning wants to, to participate in God's great if-then? 
If my people seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. Let's embrace the divine discomfort of the world that wants to try to tell us how to live so that we can begin to live for God. Are you with me, church? May it be so. May it be so. Amen and amen. Well, there's no better way, I think, to kick off a new message series talking about living life with and for God than to see someone who is honestly and sincerely making a commitment and a decision to follow Jesus. To say, Lord, I I recognize that just like everybody else in the whole wide world, I have turned away from your face and have sought things that I thought were going to bring me hope and comfort and peace and love and joy and all the other stuff. And I want to turn to you to seek and to request your forgiveness and to experience the healing and the holiness and the hope that comes from giving my life to you. So this morning, we're very, very blessed as a church to be able to receive by the water, the sacrament of baptism, someone who is giving of their lives to follow Christ, to seek God's face and the forgiveness of sins, to experience the mercy and the hope that comes from following Jesus. And so that being said, I'd like to invite Savannah Fritz and family to come and join me here at the front. I'm gonna come down to the floor. Y'all can just come right around here. Savannah, you and I are going to step to the front, right here in front of the baptismal. Savannah reached out to me a couple weeks ago uh, to say that she was ready to receive the sacrament of baptism and uh, to be a part of, or to experience the holiness of this moment. We met earlier, well, I guess late last week, because now Sunday's a new day, or a new week, right? So we met late last week. And we had a wonderful meeting and a wonderful conversation about what it means to do some of the things that we've talked about this morning. Did you get anything out of it? Please say yes. Okay, good, 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 good. All of a sudden, I was violating my own my principles, right? I was seeking approval. <laughs> Not seeking the face of God. <laughs> anyway. But Savannah, we are thrilled to be here with your family today uh, to participate in this wonderful, special, holy moment. As we discussed on Thursday, I want to ask you these questions. And this is your public profession of faith as, as a believer in Christ and someone who seeks to follow Christ. And so I want to ask you these questions. And one of the things that happens when we receive a baptism is all of us are called to remember our own baptism and to give thanks to God for who he is and what he's done in our lives. So Savannah, I want to ask you this question. Do you believe that God is the creator of the heaven of the earth and he made you with a plan and a purpose for your life? Do you believe that God sent his one and only son, Jesus, to come and die for your sins and, and to help you ex- know the, the truth that the heartbeat of heaven beats for you? I do. Do you believe that God sent his Holy Spirit to live and to dwell within you, to lead God and direct you all the ways of your life? I do. So do you repent of your sin? Do you acknowledge the times that you've tried to follow things other than God and you seek to turn your face to God to seek his forgiveness and to live according to the way he wants you to live? And will you be loyal to the church as the vehicle for how God has called each and every one of us to live our lives for him and for all the world? Amen, amen. Will you pray with me, please? Almighty God, I give you thanks for this day and I give you thanks for Savannah. I give you thanks for her family and for who they are, what they mean to you and what they mean to Hope Church. And I pray, Almighty God, that here in this moment that we may experience the truth that the scriptures proclaim to us that when even one of your children turns their heart and their mind to you that there are celebrations breaking out in all of paradise and so lord god i i thank you for the celebrations that are taking place today i hope that there is cake i hope that there are balloons and i hope that there are all kinds of rejoicing and celebration with loved ones and friends and family who are waiting on savannah to join them with you in all of eternity and so lord while our mind may be shifting to the beauty of of eternity Here in this moment, we turn our face to you. 
we thank you for the promises that you've given us that when we do indeed turn our face to you and we seek your forgiveness that you, you grant it to us and you bring us the healing that we need because of the discomfort and the fracturing that we experience in the world. And so almighty God, as we turn, as we see Savannah turn her life to you and we commit to do the same as well, on our way to the cross, we are met here by the water of baptism. Lord, as the Holy Spirit poured out upon the waters in creation, I pray that your spirit may be poured out upon this gift of water that we have in front of us today. That it may be the sign and the symbol of your cleansing love and regenerating power for Savannah as she turns her life to you and for all those almighty God who are likewise considering what it may mean to follow you with all of their hearts and their minds and their lives, I pray that this might be a moment of encouragement and challenge as well. But we give you thanks for Savannah. We give you thanks for her family. We give you thanks for this moment as we get a glimpse into eternity for who you are and what you're doing for us and the love of your son and our savior Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that comes to rest upon us all this day and forevermore. I ask these things in the name of Jesus, your son and our savior. Amen. All right, Savannah, if you would come on and join me. And friends and family, if you want to come and gather around kind of to the side and to the back, take your hand, step down the end. You good? All right, good, good, good. Yeah, you're fine. You ready, Savannah? Mm -hmm. All right. Savannah Nicole, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. And Almighty God, seal among, seal within Savannah your love, your power, your forgiveness, your grace, and your mercy that she may experience the goodness of who you are now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Savannah, once again, church, let's give God a round of applause and let's thank Savannah for her courage and her commitment to follow God now and forevermore. We have some wonderful servants who are, gonna, who are here to give you a little aid and comfort. I promise the water is warm. But church, we also have a commitment and a responsibility for Savannah and all God's children. So we repeat after me, with God's help, we so order our lives after the example of Jesus that Savannah and all God's children everywhere will see in us an example of God's hope, his love, and his power this day and forevermore. Amen and woo doggy. <laughs> Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you.